Well, this week we are beginning a new sermon series called Time. It's just in time for time, I guess. Where for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about time. Now, one thing that's true for most people in our culture, at least I know in those that I know, is that uh, we are, as a culture, pretty aware of time, right? If you've spent time outside of our culture, like you've done missions work in another part of the world, you understand that time is somewhat relative elsewhere, right? So Kevin and Tanya, they've been in Kenya. Kenyan time is different than American time. I've done missions work in central Mexico. The time there is very different than it is uh, here in America. Our our friends who came and shared, the Andersons, um, they're, they're in the Dominican Republic, and they will readily tell you that time is somewhat relative where they live. And if somebody says, this is when it's going to happen, well, you, you have to understand that's a broad general term, not an exact term, which violates everything in my good German heritage. <laughs> right? I want it on time. When it says, that's when I want it. It's kind of like that joke you've probably seen. It says, you know, if, if a man says he's going to do it, you don't have to remind him every six months about it, right? We'll get to it eventually. Time is relative. But the truth of the matter is, you know, if you look at my wrists, I don't wear a watch anymore. You know, I used to have a bunch of watches. I used to love wearing watches. Uh, back in the day, way back, some of you might remember these, I had, a, I had a handful of different Swatch watches, right? They were awesome. They were awesome back in 1987. Um, made me cool, all right? Uh, I had a couple of them. I actually still have them, but that's neither here nor there. Um, So I loved wearing watches back in the day, and then as I got older, I'd get nicer watches, right, and gold or silver and leather and and all those kinds of things, and I was always proud of my watches. But as time has evolved, as our world has evolved, I I have switched. I mean, I haven't worn a watch, and in fact, I don't even know that I've owned a watch other than old ones that don't work anymore. I don't think I've owned a watch in at least a decade, if not longer, because of this, right? In this day and age, this is my clock. If I want to know what time it is, it's 10.59, so now now I know how much more time I got to spend here this morning. It is my alarm clock. It's my calendar. It, it, It keeps me on task. It's wonderful because I can set a reminder that will tell me of a meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., that I would otherwise forget about on my own, right? So it'll, it'll honk and beep at me and remind me, hey, hey, you need to get going, right? Hey, go pick up your kid from school. Without this, I honestly don't remember how I used to live. And so time has evolved, time has changed, and uh, time is an important thing in our culture, right? So think of the times where we pay attention to time, right? My wife's a school teacher. The kids are always watching the clock, waiting for that bell to ring, right? I don't think that speaks to her teaching ability. That's just students in general. She's a good teacher. But kids are always looking at the time. What time is it, right? Or maybe some of you are looking at your watch going, what time is this guy going to be done? Noon? Noon. That's what I promise. I'll be done before noon. Okay? That's kind of a joke. But we worry about time. You know, there's, there's a clock on the back wall. I use that to do, certainly make sure that I stay on pace so that we do get out of here at a reasonable hour. Now, every once in a while, we, we lose track of time, don't we? Now, a lot of times it's for good reasons. I'm prone to losing track of time when I start reading, reading a good book. I read a lot of my Kindle, um, and I'll find myself, I'll wake up at weird hours of the morning holding my Kindle with my glasses still on my face because I fell asleep reading because I lost track of time. Right? A good book all my life, good books have put me to just out of sync with time. Um, talking with an old friend. You haven't talked to somebody for a while, they give you a call or they stop in, and in a blink, an hour, two hours, three hours, just disappear out of your life. And everything else you were planning to do then just got set aside. And that's okay, because we want to spend that time that way. But we are incredibly conscious about time. And... How often is it, you ever have people go, what time is it in your life? People ever ask you this? They look around and say, what time is it? Especially at work. I used to 
wait tables for a long time. And my coworkers were always wondering what time it was because we were always wondering, when do we get to go home? So we ask that question, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? A question that comes up frequently. But the problem is, that isn't the most important question that we should be asking when it comes to time. And for the next few weeks, I'm going to ask you to rethink the questions we ask about time. And I'm going to give you, in fact, a better question to ask about time. And my guess is as soon as I tell you what that question is, you're going to go, he's right, that's a better question. Then what time is it, right? And the better question that we have relates to time, not what time is it, but rather it is, what am I doing with my time? Okay? What am I doing with my time? What time of it is important in the short term? What am I doing with my time is important in the long term, right? And the problem with constantly checking what time it is is that it's a constant reminder. It's, it's this drag upon us, in fact. It's, it's one of those things that can, in fact, be even depressing because as you realize what time it is, you also realize along with it that your time is running out, right? And I don't care how old you are. It's true. Our time on this earth is running out. We're all running out of time. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Yay! And it seems that the older I get, the faster time goes by, right? My son is seven, and, and, and I swear, since he was born seven years ago, the speed at which time passes has at least doubled in my life. It's just here and there and gone in a blink. So one of the worst things that we can actually ask is what time is it? Because it's just a reminder that our time is just tick, tick, tick. Our time is just ticking away. Now the whole idea of time going by quickly is actually a biblical theme. I don't know if you knew that. Here's a really happy thought from Job. You know that's a joke if you've ever read Job, right? But here's an idea from Job. Job says this. Job says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Right? You probably aren't going to find that on a calendar, on a Hallmark card somewhere. Or, <laughs> right? But Job doesn't stop there, in fact. Job 9.25, he says this. He says, My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. Woohoo! Right? Now, as sad as those sound, I promise the whole series won't be like that. But it is a reminder of something that we are all well aware of, but we don't honestly necessarily want to be reminded of all the time. And it's that our time here is going by really quick. Now, if you're like in that under 18 age range, you might not have reached that point quite yet where you realize this, right? But I assure you, if you're under 18, the day is coming where you will realize that time is passing quickly. When you're young, it seems like time takes forever, right? You're waiting for your next birthday. You're waiting to get your driver's license. You're waiting to graduate. You're, you're, it seems like you're always waiting on something. But after about 18, boy, life speeds up and it really gets moving. And the reality is there's a finish line for each and every one of us, frankly. I'm reminded of that every time I look at my retirement account, right? I look at that thing going, I want to retire, but I might need to push that back a few more years because it's not running as fast as I would like that total to be going, right? And then if that isn't enough, once upon a time, somebody sent me this link. It's a link to a, a website that's called deathclock.com. Okay, you can look that up. Don't look it up while I'm talking. Look it up later. But you can go to deathclock.com. I checked mine again last night to see how much longer I have to live. And it informed me that I have 905,666,777 seconds, give or take a couple of seconds, to live by the data that I put in. You go in there, you type in some different things. You say whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you smoke, how tall you are, what year you were born, you know, how much you weigh, all those kinds of things. And it will spit out some average to tell you this is... 
by our estimates, how much time you have left. Joy. <laughs> but the point of it is, maybe we need to be a little bit more focused on what we are doing with our time. Maybe, maybe even probably, I should begin to be a little more focused on how I live my life or how I spend my time. Maybe I need to live in such a way that I am living so that I live with my time with the end of my time in mind. Now with that in mind, we get some great help from the Bible. And I promise you it's more cheery than Job. This guy wrote a big section of the Old Testament. In fact, he's one of the big hitters. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. How many know who that is? Moses, right? But not only did Moses write the first five books of the Old Testament, he also wrote one of the Psalms. How many of you knew that? Yeah, Moses wrote one of the Psalms. We usually think of David, right? David is the Psalm writer. But there were some others who wrote them, and, and even Moses snuck this one in. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 90 today. There are some pew Bibles. You're certainly welcome to look it up on your phone or your iPad if you brought something along. The other thing is, if you have... a uh, iPad or an iPhone or something like that, uh, feel free to check in that you're here at Glory Baptist and saying, hey, was here worshiping this morning. And then you can say, you know, wonderful things about me or not if I wasn't very good. That's okay. I speak the truth. That's okay. I can handle it. But uh, we'll be in Psalm 90 for the rest of the morning here. And while you look it up, let me give you a little background on why Moses is such a great source for us to learn about time from. Now, we've been talking about Moses on Wednesday nights, if you're here, so our kids who are kindergarten through sixth grade have been getting this for the last uh, couple of weeks, and they'll have it for a few more weeks to come. And, and Moses, as you may know, was when he was born as a baby, he was taken in by Pharaoh's daughter from the banks of the Nile River. He was raised as an Egyptian, but he was a Jew, or a Hebrew, as they would have called them at the time. And, and then one day, late in his teens, or maybe possibly in his early 20s, he all of a sudden came to this realization that even though he had been raised in an Egyptian household, in fact, in the Pharaoh's household, in the king's house, with the best of the best at his disposal, with the greatest teachers and the greatest resources and greatest supplies, despite growing up in that Egyptian culture, he comes to the realization that he is still, in fact, a Hebrew. And it's at that point that he begins to see what's going on with the other Hebrews around him. He sees that they're slaves, and he begins to get a little fed up with the way that they're treated, and he decides he's going to do something about it. And as a result, he unintentionally kills an Egyptian man. And so as a result of that, he ends up having to flee the country, fleeing for his life. And he ends up out in the wilderness, one extreme to the other, living in the palace one day, and in the wilderness the next, right? And he's basically was the prince of Egypt. Now he's a fugitive running for his life. And in the wilderness, he runs into this family with some sheep, and he gets hired on to be a shepherd. Now here's the interesting thing about the story of Moses. Moses spent 40 years, 4-0, four 40 years. Just pause and think about that. Moses spent 40 years, and not only 40 years, but the 40 probably best years of his life. His prime. Moses spent 40 years with his life on pause, doing nothing, watching the grass grow, kicking rocks, every day was the same, right? He'd get up in the morning, he'd watch the sheep. The sun would wake him, the wind would blow on him, He'd walk around with some sheep. The sun would start to go down. He'd lie down and go to bed with sheep. Every day for 40 years. 40 long years in the wilderness. And then after 40 years, God said, okay, Moses, I have a plan and a purpose for your life. And so God brings Moses back out of the wilderness, takes him back to Egypt, where we know the story where Moses comes in and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, 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 right? And eventually, we know where that story leads, that Moses 
goes on to lead the Egyptians into freedom. He becomes a household name. He writes five books of the Bible. This guy is famous, all that kind of stuff, a storybook tale. So that's the background of Moses. And with that as the backdrop, it gave him an incredible perspective on time. And in today's psalm, Moses is going to give us that perspective. He's going to share a a little bit of that view with us. And here's what Moses is going to tell us. Our context is everything here. In the big picture, our time here on earth is just a blip of time. And that is important because it reminds us that we are not the center of the universe. We are not the big storyline in God's timeline. And as Moses begins to explain all this to us in the form of a psalm, um, we're going to see in this poem uh, that he's going to share his heart and his understanding that only God could give him about what time means and what it should mean to us and how we should deal with and address it. So feel free to read along if you'd like. We'll, I think, show some of it up on the screen as well. I'm going to start with Psalm 91 through 2 and just read that and we'll talk about it. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, my Bible says. Moses says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever, you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses is reminding us the story isn't about us. The story is God's story. Time is bookended by God, right? Before there was time... God was. And God is greater than time. He created time. And when time ends, God still will be. God was there before us, is here with us, and will still be here after us. Verse 3. Moses says, You return man to dust, and you say, Return, O children of man. Moses is saying, no matter how cool that you think you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter what you have accomplished, at the end of it all, God's going to return you to dust. Our our life is as a vapor. Verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight, O Lord, are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. A thousand years is like a blink to God. Can you imagine that? Maybe one of us in this room today might live to be a hundred. I have a, a lady in my last church who is heading towards a hundred and two. Right? They're rare. Not many people ever make that triple digit mark. Moses is saying a thousand years. Add an extra zero to the end of that. It's like that. There's nothing to God. Look at verse 6. He says, in the morning, this grass that he was talking about, in the morning it flourishes and it's renewed. In the evening, it fades and it withers. Moses is comparing our life to a grass that that just grows in the morning, but it passes by night. Our time is short. Our stay is brief. We're only here for a limited number of revolutions on this ball of mud as it circles our sun. And the point that Moses is making here is that, not that your life doesn't matter, but his point is that life is so brief that it can't all be about you. It can't all be about the here and now. We have to think of greater and better and bigger and more eternal things. Jump ahead to verse 10 there. Verse 10 says this. Moses says, The years of our life are 70, or even, by reason, the strength of 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. He's saying, even if we have a good life, there's still going to be some sorrow in it. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, doesn't care for us. This is Moses who experienced this very thing. Moses who knew the ups and downs of life. Moses who lived at the pinnacle in the palace. And Moses 
who walked with sheep in obscurity. Moses who knew success and Moses, Moses who stood there walking with roughly a million Hebrews behind him mumbling, grumbling, and complaining. Moses knew. Verse 11. Who considers the power of your anger, O Lord, and your wrath according to the fear of you? Let me interpret that for you. What Moses is saying is that if, if we could see God as he actually is, if we could just see God truly, we would give him the reverence that he is due. If we could see more clearly, we would be living with God's purposes and not our own. But the problem is, what Moses is saying, we don't see with that clarity. We don't always see God's purpose and plan and how we fit into it, do we? But Moses steps in and he says, let me tell you what. Here's some wisdom for you. And it's that very wisdom that's going to be our focus for the next couple of weeks to come. And that brings us to verse 12, the, the keystone verse, the focus verse. Moses says this. He says, Lord, Father God, teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. God, teach us to number our days. Teach us because we don't know how to do it by ourselves, frankly. Teach us because we don't know how. In other words, Lord, teach us to live as if our days are numbered. Most of us as adults, we, we know that our days are numbered. Most of us as adults, we've numbered days before, in fact. Remember before many of you here have been married? Right before you got married? Remember that countdown to the wedding, right? If you asked your bride, how long until you're married, right? How, how long until your wedding? When are you getting married? Most brides would say, it's going to be 14 days, 3 hours, and 27 minutes, and if he's late, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> right? Or, how about counting down to a due date? Right? Counting down to a due date is one of those interesting ones, because you're not exactly sure. Our son's due date was July 19th. He was born August 3rd. Imagine that. They missed by a few. That was a long wait. So we know how to number our days as adults. Or, or even it's something as simple as counting down the days until you go on vacation, right? Oh man. Four hours and I'm out of here for a week. Or if you ask my dad, how long till you retire? He can almost tell you to the minute. And that's a number of years down the road. But we as adults, we've kind of learned to number our days in some ways. But Moses is saying this. God, teach us to live as if our days are numbered since we don't know when that end day is going to come. Moses says, teach us, O oh God, so that we might gain a heart of wisdom. And this is, this is so big. He says, I realize it's not going to necessarily help you make decisions with all your time but by having this mindset it helps us reframe what we do with our time so that we will make lasting decisions so that the things we choose to do the things we choose to invest ourselves in the most precious commodity we have is our time and the things we choose to give that to will have a lasting impact. Because without this, it's easy for us just to let time slip through our hands like sand, just running through our fingers. So Moses says, God, teach us to number our days so that we might gain a heart of wisdom, so that we might be better in making decisions about what we do with the time for the rest of our days. And by doing this, we will make better decisions as parents. By doing this, we'll be making better relational decisions, decisions in our lives. 
our decisions will be far wiser if I make them in the context of God's bigger view of things, in God's view, eternal view. And it's living with this idea and understanding that our days are numbered that will drive us to better decision-making. Now listen, this isn't depressing in any sort of way. It's not that death is necessarily coming knocking today for any of us. It might make your, make your peace with the Lord and know Him as your Savior. But God has given us days and weeks and months and years, hopefully, to live yet. And God wants us to live those days with purpose. And as I've said before, if you're not dead, you're not done. God has a purpose for you. And Moses is, is just standing here today saying, there is a grander story that we get to be part of, and we're not the main character of it. We get to play just a, a small part, but perhaps an important part, in something that is far bigger, far greater than any of us could ever imagine. So God, teach me to number my days so that I may capture some of your wisdom, so that I may bring you glory and honor in the things that I choose to do. Because my life is just, my life is just too brief for me to live just for me. Moses says, I don't want to waste my 70 or 80 years living for my own glory. Because in the end, that's not going to make any lasting difference. It's not going to matter. And none of it will endure if it's all about me. Lord, teach me to maximize my life in the grand scheme of things, in what you are up to in this world, and what you are doing in this world, so that going forward, Lord, what I do with my time makes a difference. That was Moses' take on time. So going forward in this series, we're going to be talking about some really practical things when it comes to this. Wisdom that we can all apply to our lives, myself included as well. Wisdom we can apply to our lives so that on a day-by-day -day basis we can live better for the glory of God. We want to live in such a way that we leave a legacy. It's one of the things I've, I've talked with well, both Chuck and Judy in the last week about. About a tremendous legacy that they have left. A beautiful legacy through their kids and through their grandkids. A legacy through this church, through their church and Stacy that they served wonderfully in. We want to make a lasting difference. We have to look at our time with God as the focus. And so my challenge to you this week as I wrap this up, is written there in your bulletins. My challenge to you this week is pray through Psalm 90, verse 12. Something like this. Something like, Heavenly Father, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom to fulfill your purpose for my life. And I just want you to pray that. Something like that every day this week. Pray Pray that God would begin to open your heart and open your eyes to the timeline of your life, to what you have as your most precious resource in time and how you use it. And how cool would it be if we all got this and we took this to heart and we started to examine our time and started to use all of our time in ways that brought glory to God. How many amazing stories would we have to tell if we would begin to capture all of our time, if we started to live as if we were not the focus, as if there was something, something greater that we are part of. Can you imagine that? I know God has amazing things in store for Glory Baptist Church. That's why we came here. I could see it. And if we can begin to capture this, if we can begin to redeem and leverage our time in ways that make it all about Jesus, our church will change, our families will change, our region will change. I know it. God promises it. 
So let us lean into this wisdom that the very wise man of Moses gave us. Let us number our days. Let us let put God at the center of our focus. And let us use every moment that he's given us until our final breath when we go home to be with him. Let us use it well to God's glory. Amen. Let's pray.